My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Bruno Corneau. We're at Domain DVO. It's uh, July 23rd, 2018. And Bruno will start you off by asking you, why wine? Thank you very much to, uh, to uh, um, interviewing me. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this, uh, this archive. Um, as you said, my name is Bruno Corneau. Uh, my uh, estate is called Domain DVO. Uh, I've been in the industry for a long time. I'm, I'm born in it, more or less. Uh, I grew up uh, in a family that was making wine, and I'm the fourth generation doing that in my family. Uh, originally, I'm, uh, I'm from Burgundy, and I, uh, I just followed my uh, ancestors' path of, uh, of, of making wine. Uh, so why wine, for me, it's, uh, it's an evidence. It's something that uh, we're was was uh, was making making sense mm -hmm. uh, originally not that much when I was young I was not inclined to really uh, follow the steps of my father and grandfather because it was a uh, it's it's quite of a pretty hard work mm -hmm. um, and not simple especially when you're a teenager you you don't feel all the um, the complexity of, of, of tasting of um, of all what uh, what's in question when you make wine, it's mm -hmm. very complex. Uh, so for me, it was uh, it was too hard and too complicated. So, but then I, uh, after some time, I uh, I understood that uh, that was probably the most interesting work I could, the most interesting job I could I could get. So mm -hmm. uh, I went back to it, and I, I can explain a bit my, my path. But why wine for me? Uh, it was. Uh, from the beginning, I was I was born in it in my in my with my family uh, family business. Sure. So let's talk about your path a little bit. Uh, when you you could talk about what you were thinking about doing before wine, and then once you decided on wine, how did you go get go about it? Right. So um, my grandfather was making wine. My father was growing the grapes. And uh, when I was a kid, I was uh, I was as I said like a lot of work, especially when I was uh, required to uh, to go help uh, hedge or prune or um, or do all those those hard work mm -hmm. in the vineyard. When I was a kid, I didn't like that, so I went to school and got a degree in um, uh, biochemistry and microbiology. Um, that was my not my intention to make wine at this time. I just wanted to get. Uh, my own um, my own way of uh, earning my life, uh, earning my uh, my living. So I um, I started to work in the pharmaceutical research industry, and worked in this business for ten years. Um, and it's after some time coming back every harvest to help the family uh, pick grapes and, and make wines. I, I realized that was actually I was very exciting, and it just grew up on me to realize that I, uh, I was really uh, made for that. Mm -hmm. um, so after 10 years in the pharmaceutical research industry, I realized that I was, it was not very far from, uh, winemaking was not far from, uh, from this in terms of uh, all my background being microbiology and, uh, um, mm -hmm. um, and chemistry. Um, it was easy for me to go back to school, so I went back to uh, the university, got a degree in winemaking and, uh, and, and science, uh, micro science technology, to, um, to get my, uh, my diploma. Um, that's, uh, that's the way I went, I went back to, to the family business. Was there a moment there when you realized that wine was the thing? Would you, was it was like a seminal moment when you're like, I need to get back into this, or was it more of a gradual? Yeah, it, it was graduate. It was um, doing one harvest after the the other, uh, being more confident in what I was doing and realizing that I could, I could really be good at that. Mm -hmm. um, so I embraced the job and uh, embraced all the actually the diversity of it, mm -hmm. uh, understanding that uh, winemaking, and that's my philosophy, uh, has to do as much as growing the grapes as, as making the wine. For me, uh, I think that uh, a good winemaker has to be growing grapes himself. Um, so uh, I thought I, I was touching those different um, uh, 
characteristic of, of uh, winemaking. So I could, I could, uh, I, I was feeling confident of, of being able to achieve uh, making great wines. What was your family's reaction when you initially were not going to do wine? Well, nothing really. They wanted me to do whatever I wanted. Uh, that was good. And then when I realized that uh, I wanted to go back to school and, and get a degree in winemaking, my mom was actually not very happy because I had a, I had a really good job at this, at this time. <laughs> so seeing me quitting my really good job to go into the, uh, to the, the unknown, uh, she was not very happy actually. <laughs> and then she realized actually that was, that was really the good decision. But, uh, so then um, I came to Oregon in 1996. Uh, not long after getting my, uh, my diploma and I worked as an intern at Domaine, Divi at Domaine Drouin <laughs> um, and uh, that's when I discovered Oregon and discovered, uh, discovered uh, the US in general and um, you can imagine coming from Europe like this image of the Wild West and at the time it was still kind of a Kind of wild, um, <laughs> but all this beautiful um, setting, the uh, the forest, the the ocean, uh, the mountains, uh, and the community. Mm -hmm. I, I loved it right away. I thought that it was uh, probably the most beautiful place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not only that, I realized that there was so much potential for for growing amazing grapes especially Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And um, if it was not in Burgundy, that was where I wanted to uh, continue making, making wine and seeing uh, myself um, making the best possible wine sure. uh, in the world. So that's, that's when I fell in love with Oregon. How was it that you came to come here? I mean, you mentioned you came here as an intern. Why Oregon of all the places? How did you end up here? I knew Véronique Drouin, who was uh, already the, the, the winemaker mm -hmm. and in charge of the Ben Drouin at the time. Um, and she offered me to come and join for the harvest season. So I had nothing planned particularly, so I, I, just, um, I just jumped on the uh, opportunity and, sure. and came over here. So other than Oregon, you've also made wine a lot of different places. So then uh, I wanted to travel more and see uh, if there was uh, some other exciting places in the world I was making wine. So I went to uh, South Africa and I did, a, I did a season over there. Um, then I came back to France, worked a little bit uh, in a larger company in France. Um, then I had the great opportunity to work for a, a really nice negociant uh, close to Macon that was making a tremendous Chardonnay, uh, some of the best in the world Chardonnay that you can find or uh, buying grapes. So I was in charge of uh, supervising the vineyards and also, also making making wine there. So I, I, I loved it and discovered all of the, about like extremely high end Chardonnays. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then after, after a year, I've been contacted by a company in Napa that wanted to... Uh, uh, I, was, I was pretty strong on, um, on pedography, recognition of, of, uh, of the different clo or varieties, grape varieties. And this company asked me if I could, um, I could help them uh, remap their vineyard yeah. um, in Napa. So, uh, it was a mission, but I was uh, ready to discover uh, California and Napa, so I jumped on the uh, opportunity and, and went there uh, with my wife. And we, we, we wanted to, to come back to the U.S. anyway, so it was a good opportunity. So we worked in Napa for a year. Uh, I did their project and then came back to France. Uh, and this time um, I, was, uh, I was not ready to take over the family business uh, at the time and uh, I still wanted to discover some, uh, some other uh, places around the world um, and so uh, right bef after I came back from California I got a, I got a call from uh, one of my uh, former uh, professor at the university uh, knowing I was kind of a more of an adventurous uh, type of person 
and um, he um, presented me this project of uh, growing grapes in Tahiti uh, where this uh, uh, developer wanted to uh, have his own vineyard and, and create something really unique uh, but quite challenging. So um, I thought about it for a little bit and then uh, decided to, to take over the, the challenge and uh, I went there. Um, so it was quite an, an adventure. Um, so we've been developing a vineyard and, and making wine there for three years. Um, different uh, from anything else in the world uh, from different ways. The, f the first thing being we're, it's very um, uh, remote, so difficult to access and mm -hmm. to uh, have equipment and all the infrastructure that you would need to, to, make, uh, to, make, to grow grapes and make wine. Uh, second would be um, the climate, it's tropical, so completely different from, from the, the traditional uh, growing regions. Third, um, the, uh, the, the only land we found to develop a vineyard was, or the, the, the potentially suitable, was on an atoll. So uh, also a completely different type of soil with a very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, calcareous because it's co I mean, coral rock. Mm -hmm. So I had to grow grapes on, on coral uh, soil. And very close to the uh, ocean level, we're about like one meter over, over the water a table, which is salty water table. <laughs> so a lot of challenges, but um, so I, I've been through all of them and it went really well. I developed uh, 10 acres and um, I wanted to be, at this time, I, I mean, there was, I was starting to understand um, I mean, people were starting to talk about sustainability and being organic or, and it was even more true on a remote island that was really uh, depending on its environment. So for me, there was no uh, way to really uh, start using uh, nasty chemicals mm -hmm. or herbicide or anything of that kind. So that at this moment that I realized that uh, I had to embrace uh, working on organically and even further, uh, I discovered also the biodynamic uh, movement at the time. I was not really aware of that, but uh, I started to learn about all different ways to be as, as sustainable and, and close to the environment as possible. And uh, I learned about uh, biodynamy and I embraced it right away mm -hmm. working over there in, in, uh, in French Polynesia. So, um, yeah, being, uh, being successful, it helped us uh, create the first wines. I made, uh, and because it's, um, it's tropical, so it's, um, it's growing all the time. So mm -hmm. I had um, two harvests a year. Wow. So I, would, I was making uh, my trials uh, easier to work with because sure. I, could, I could really realize if, it, if my, my different trials were working, working or not working. Uh, I developed um, Carignan mostly, which is uh, the variety that uh, was growing the, the best in, in this environment. And then uh, I planted then 10 acres of that and started to make red and rosé. And, um, and we've been very successful, helped by the, uh, the local people, helped by the government, etc. So it was, uh, it was quite, quite interesting. But life on an atoll, uh, remote atoll on the ocean, is not necessarily easy, uh, especially for the family. Mm -hmm. So um, we got our first son over there and decided we wanted to go back to the US. So I got a job in Washington state and uh, started to work in, um, in the, on the Columbia, uh, Columbia River mm -hmm. um, uh, AVA. Uh, it was in 2000. To. And, um, and I, I still had an eye on, on Oregon at the time, but because of the, uh, of the transfer of, of, of work, of visa, etc., I had to stay for some time in, 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 or, uh, in Washington. So I, I, I did uh, really like the, the, you know, growing different varieties. I was growing Riesling, but also, mm -hmm. also, also some Cabernet and Merlot and um, Sangiovese, all kind of uh, warm climate varieties. 
um, except for the Riesling, but we were close to the um, to the cliffs of the Columbia River, so we had some cold nights. So it was it was quite interesting for that. And uh, but but my 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 blood being into made of Pinot, <laughs> I really wanted to to go back to to make to make Pinot. So sure. he, he was either going back to France, but by the time my cousin already took over. Uh, some of the family business, which was was good because we wanted to keep it in the family. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I was not I was not able to really to take over, and, and I really wanted to stay in the U.S. at this time. And um, I found an opportunity to come back in in Oregon back in uh, to, at the end of 2009, and started to work with uh, Solena Estate, mm -hmm. uh, growing the grapes and making the wine with Laurent Montalieu. A uh, long-time friend. I've known him for 25 years, and um, and then when uh, when the building has been uh, uh, sold to a larger Californian company, uh, we moved the production to Northwest Wine Company, which I've been the director of winemaking since. Yes. Uh, I was still in charge of the vineyards, uh, and I was uh, in charge of all the contracts we had with all our, our growers. So. Uh, at this time, I was working with probably 70 different vineyards in the valley, uh, growing grapes from, uh, or in, I mean, contracting with all these uh, these people and making sure we uh, we were an, have good understanding on uh, their spray program, sure. uh, their all well, their farming um, regimen, um, and uh, and embracing the the uh, biodynamic farming more and more because I mean some of them were by farmers and some of them were uh, orange farmers. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was a good way to, uh, to really see the diversity, um, see, um, for me, it was a, the best way possible to really um, understand the different AVAs of uh, Oregon, the Willamette Valley in particular, and, uh, and these, uh, these slopes, um, the different farming uh, approach mm -hmm. uh, was quite interesting, so I learned a lot from these different growers. But of some of some of the wines we were making, because we were making wine from all the different sure. uh, sites, um, each of them being uh, being fermented in a different batch. So uh, that was the best possible way of uh, approaching uh, the different elements of soil. Uh, that we uh, we have here mm -hmm. in, in Oregon. That's also another reason why I really I really embrace the, the place here. Uh, as I saw, I, I said the, the 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 community people are so welcoming. Uh, they're so ready to uh, to to the community to work with with each other mm -hmm. and to really make sure we all doing our best. To have um, the Willamette Valley on the map as one of the best Pinot Noir producer in the world. Sure. And then finally, this place. So uh, in 2012, I was starting to. Um, I was, you know, I was thinking of, of making a wine on my own mm -hmm. um, with my name on it at some point. Um, and then I've been approached by a, a longtime friend that uh, wanted to develop a vineyard. And um, he was in France, and he wanted me to help him uh, create this um, um, this uh, estate in, in in France. So I went there, and we looked at different options. Uh, at some point, I told him, "Well, you should really come to Oregon and see what we have available there, and all the potential that we have." So it did, and then we looked around, and we decided that was the best. That was definitely a, a better, a better way to go. So uh, 2012, I, I put it some um, some wines on the side that I you know, made, and decided it would be our first wine. We didn't have a name at the time, but we knew we wanted the best, the best wines for this uh, domain. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we, I bowled it. Uh, we didn't have a name at the time, but we, uh, we, we I, wanted, I didn't want to, f I didn't want to commercialize it until I had the right place. Mm -hmm. um, so we looked for uh, a place to develop, uh, to develop a vineyard. 
Uh, as I may have mentioned, I'm, I'm really uh, fond of uh, geology. Uh, behind me, uh, if you can see, there are uh, some jars with different type of soils that correspond, each of them correspond to a different AVA of the valley. Originally, the people who have, um, who have uh, selected the, or defined the, uh, the AVAs uh, did that uh, you know, according to the soil types. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think it's, a, it's a, an amazing idea. Um, and uh, I, I really have experienced uh, so much in, in Burgundy, knowing that uh, even the soil that is quite similar might have a little bit of a difference in terms of, uh, of, uh, of clay content or, uh, or drainage mm -hmm. um, or exposure. Uh, could give a completely different different wine because we're talking about the same variety. It's all Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. um, so all these different uh, elements that creates the uh, we, we, we say uh, terroir, uh, which is really the um, the uh, the combination of the soil, but the, the exposure, the drainage, the wind, uh, the, the the you know the depth of the soil, etc. Um, here uh, we had, you know, it's, it's more diverse, but it's also a good way to explore by using the, uh, the geology and the soil of different areas to create, uh, to create a, nice, uh, a nice definition of all of, of these areas. So mm -hmm. I'm making a Dundee Hills, I'm making a Chelem Mountain, I'm making a Yamil Carlton, I'm making a McMinnville area and a Ribbon Ridge. Um, since I've been really working with all the different vineyards in the valley, I always, in, in blind tastings, I've always been back to Ribbon Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main reason for me is that um, the clay content is the highest, even though it's marine sedimentary. It's the same as, potentially, as um, Yamil Carlton instead of a definition. Uh, the clay content of um, Ribbon Ridge is, is higher, and for me, it's really the closest that you can find in Oregon from uh, from my, my my own parents' vineyards in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was making sense to to go back to this to to to, to try to find a place here on on Ribbon Ridge. That's also the smallest AVA in the valley, so it's uh, it has some some kind of a. Uh, image of the you know the the cherry and the cake you know the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the real uh, jewel of the of the entire valley. Um, so we we looked around if there is any uh, there was any any spots available and uh, and I love this site so it was not for sale but we went to talk to the the owner and uh, and he he was um, after some time he he understood we could do a, a good deal together mm -hmm. so he. Um, he, um, he accepted to sell the property to us. So in 2014, we acquired it and, and started to develop the estate. Um, so for me, uh, as I said, I wanted a, a right place to, to show the wines I was making. So it was uh, obvious that I needed a tasting room in the middle of the vineyard to, to really express uh, the, uh, the characteristics of the wines. Sure. So we started to um, to create a to redesign and, and started to build right away in 2015 the uh, Domaine Divio uh, tasting room. Um, I wanted to work my wines through uh, my excitement of being here in Oregon, but also with all my um, uh, experience working in Burgundy, all my uh, background, family mm -hmm. history. Uh, so I wanted this to be expressed also in, uh, in the names, in my wines. So that's why we decided to, to, uh, to use Divio as the name of the, of the estate. Uh, Divio is the, the name of Dijon. Uh, that the first name it was uh, uh, known under. Okay. Uh, I think the Romans uh, used this name as this fort. In Burgundy, it was uh, it was Dijon. It was not Burgundy at the time. <laughs> uh, it was just a, a fort, and it was uh, in um, in Gaul's uh, language. It meant um, it meant a sacred place. So uh, I thought it was a great, great, great name for us to to use. Um, 
a domain, domain because it's a, that's a way we call an estate in sure. Burgundy, mm -hmm. um, and um, and we, we we also gave a name for the vineyard. It's uh, it's called Clo Gallia. Um, Clo means enclosed property. So it's uh, a lot of Clo in Burgundy as well because they're they're just a, it's one piece of property that's enclosed by by walls. Here in Oregon we have some deer, so we enclose it with with larger higher fence. Um, to protect the vines um, and Gallia because it's uh, the goals um, yeah the, the uh, enclosed property of the goals um, <laughs> I'm a goal from origin <laughs> that's great. That's and, a great way to name it. and I love the community here Ribbon Ridge is I mean people are, they are there's there's a lot of people that embrace uh, biodynamic farming or organic farming here so I, I was feeling really really well really comfortable in this environment good why was it important to you to showcase all the different AVAs through your wine? Because they are, you know, as, as they are in, in Burgundy, so, so different from, uh, from one block to the next. Uh, like four rows could be of, of, of these grapes could be so different than the next four. Um, that uh, for us, it would start with, with geology, the difference of soil, but also um, they are different. So, I mean, it's important to showcase. It's not only important; like it's it's exciting, it's interesting to showcase the difference that they can they can make, the soil can make on the wine. Um, and I'm still uh, there are definitely several great vineyards that are recognized in the valley for their uh, exceptional qualities. Even though I didn't want to focus on those particularly, and I wanted to focus more on an AVA, so some of my wines under one particular AVA might be a source from only one vineyard, though. But uh, but I don't know if I if I want to keep this vineyard over over time. Like um, for some reason, I want I want to change to another. I still have the um, the opportunity to. To jump to the to the next vineyard that that's probably have the same characteristic because the soil is quite similar. Sure. Um, but one day I may I may decide on, on doing a single vineyard uh, designation. But I don't know yet. I, I want I want to be able to to express really what uh, what the geolo geology is about and not the vineyard particular vineyard. Um, sure. It's, uh, by itself, uh, my estate. Uh, we also going to have uh, to start with like a, a blend of different blocks and pl I planted, but uh, after several years, if if one block is performing you know systematically well, we'll also decide on uh, on choosing this one to do a single bottling of this sure. wine. But f for now, it's just like trying to understand uh, what the soil is about to give to the to the Pinot Noir. Sure. So before we move on too far, I want to back up to Tahiti for a second because it's such an interesting story. All right. So w you mentioned all the challenges you had. What, what were some of the things you came up with to overcome some of the challenges? Like you mentioned, like the coral and the soil and things like that. And did it always seem like it was a worthwhile project or were there times when it felt like it was too much trouble for its, what it was worth? Uh, I've, never, I've never been discouraged, uh, even though it was quite hard at some, at some point. Um, I think the most uh, challenging is to is not to if you have a problem you can you can resolve it. It's when you you know how to resolve it, but you don't have the material because the material is like is six months away in a boat mm -hmm. somewhere else. Uh, that's sometimes kind of frustrating. Um, communication as well, like we it was a. Uh, like late, late last century, uh, 1999. <laughs> uh, internet was just starting. Or here in the US, you probably had some good connection. In Tahiti, on a remote <laughs> atoll, it was a, a dial up system, and you could click on uh, return, and then maybe an half hour later, you had the, the connection was on, <laughs> and you could click to the next to, to order something, or to. It was, it was quite. Quite difficult at this. Mm -hmm. that um, otherwise, um, I mean, same. Like I had a lot of help just because I was enthusiastic. 
if you're not enthusiastic, you know, people will just, they, they, they don't care much. And they don't need you to start with. So labor is another challenge. Mm -hmm. um, they don't need to work. Uh, so why should they? <laughs> <laughs> Right, so uh, I've been able to build a team because of the, I think because of my enthusiasm, uh, they, were, they were happy to help mm -hmm. somehow. Um, and, and yeah, and, and they, they were, I think they were excited by the, uh, by the challenge as well. So, um, so I've been able to, that's been difficult to build a, a nice team to start with. But then when I got the, the right people, I think it's, it's, it's true for this uh, experience, but it's true all the time, right? Uh, you need to find the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the most important thing for success. Try to, f to create a team with the right people. Sure. Uh, and then... Um, um, well, finance was sometimes a little bit of a challenge, but not, not, not too bad. Uh, mm -hmm. But then what I really loved about it was actually this challenge, uh, the challenge of, uh, of creating solutions. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you have to be creative all the time. And that was, uh, that was quite interesting because of that. And I never found anything that was uh, that completely put, put me to a stop. Sure. So I've been able to keep going. And then uh, uh, I found when I went decided to leave the project and go back to the US, I found somebody to take over um, uh, another winemaker from France mm -hmm. that I recruited. I went back to France to recruit him. And then he's still in charge over there. So he's still making wine and, uh, and growing grapes. So he doubled the, the size of the, of the vineyards. He's 20 acres now. And, uh, and they're producing wines that are in pretty much all the supermarkets and uh, and restaurants and shops in, in Tahiti and now in, in France as well and some places in Paris. Uh, before I left, I got a good uh, score um, review on uh, at the Paris uh, Fair. Mm -hmm. So I was I was quite interested, uh, happy of, of, of seeing that uh, going to uh, coming to to life. Yeah. What was the reaction of people in France when you were telling them, when you told them this was Tahitian it's still, wine? It's, it's still kind of a extremely high, you know, incredible curiosity. Like it's something <laughs> like it's kind of a, I mean, they are intrigued. So they buy it just to see what it tastes mm -hmm. like. And, uh, so we're making like, I mean, very, very good quality um, out, of, out of it. So it's uh, two harvests per year, one in May, one in November. Um, and I think my my successor uh, moved away from from making red because uh, red was not as easy to predict in terms of color because of the the, the, the temperature is is always high, mm -hmm. so it, it blocks the anthocyanin development. So it, it's not you never get a really deep red, um, especially with the, the grape we decided to mm -hmm. to grow. Uh, so we decided to turn uh, all the whites into whites, which, which works really well, so it has different kinds. Um, and they're all pretty much from Carignan, so is, yeah, red grapes making white sure. wine, which is uh, not uncommon at all. So. Is there a future in tropical wine? Is that something that people are going to do? Uh, there is. Probably not in Tahiti because it's too small. It's, it's, too, it's too, as I said, like the remoteness of it that makes sure. it very complicated. Oh. But uh, Brazil has been uh, a, a, a huge producer uh, for uh, for some time, and uh, and it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, India is starting to open, get open to to wine, uh, but they've been growing grapes for a long time, making making um, table grapes mm -hmm. and, and raisins. Uh, so they, they know how to grow, grow grapes really well with three harvests a year, <laughs> with the, so, wow. you know, but some particular um, varieties are growing. I, I tried some in Tahiti, some some sure. of, the, of these varieties. Um, it was not doing good in terms of wine quality, though. But you can make um, yeah. So they they know how to grow grapes. They know the places where they can they can grow uh, well, and. Um, and I think there is uh, so much potential, like China, there's so much potential for, for um, 
uh, for for the mar for a market mm -hmm. for, for those wines that they're they're, they're really starting right now. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you also mentioned your time at Northwest Wine Company. I'm curious. It's such a unique model, um, and you mentioned some of the advantages you got there. I'm kind of curious how you found your role there, and how you found working with all the different winemakers uh, from around the, from around the area. Well, we are working. We not well. The model of the company is to um, we have three legs. Mm -hmm. um, we can we're making wines for uh, clients. Mm -hmm. Uh, in these cases, we're not allowing the clients to take decisions on the winemaking. We are the only one making the wines. Okay. Uh, we are a team of uh, that's four winemakers now, um, and we're taking all the decisions ourselves. The client would tell us um, what um, the style he wants. Uh, price points, um, source of fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, they can bring their own fruit. Uh, they, we, we can we can provide the fruit uh, depending on what they're mm -hmm. trying to achieve. Um, so on this side, that's, that's that's said. Then the second part, the second leg is the um, uh, partnership. So we partner with uh, chains of restaurants or. Um, some brands that that wants to uh, to have a production somewhere um, so that's us mm -hmm. as well so they are taking care of all the marketing part we're taking care of all the winemaking part mm -hmm. so same like we we take all the decisions on the marketing and the third leg is um, making wine for our, our own brands we have, we own our own brands and we have uh, um, a lot <laughs> of different brands sure sure so with the four, you said a four-person winemaking team. How does that work? That dynamic work. Uh, well, that works um, as, as I said as a team. So mm -hmm. uh, there are two winemakers that are day to day uh, on site, uh, following up all the wines on day to day uh, basis, and then uh, Laurent and me are coming to uh, uh, all the blends, mm -hmm. tastings. Uh, we sign up on bottlings and, and we decide on uh, on different uh, different path of, of uh, or when when we have a decision to take to make on uh, on a particular treatment or when we want to have uh, uh, you know you know we know we're going to receive a, a different type of grapes or when we want to to change the uh, the wine making protocol for one particular reason we we all decide that together. Sure. Uh, or we, when we want to buy equipment, that's usually my decision. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So you talked a little bit about this earlier, but, uh, with your kind of your philosophy. I'm curious if you, if you have a specific like grape growing philosophy and how like biodynamics mm -hmm. fits into that. Yeah. So as I mentioned, it like uh, biodynamic. It's um, it's a philosophy of, of growing grapes or growing any any kind of uh, actually uh, crop. Um, it's not a, it doesn't apply necessarily only to grapes. Um, it's um, it's a bit too I would say complicated, but uh, it would take more time to, to explain that, that I may have here. But uh, it's a way to embrace uh, your farm uh, and to to consider your farm as a living entity on its own. So you're gonna make all the elements of this farm to work together so um, you have a, it's not only it's over it's it's beyond sustainable mm -hmm. um, sustainable is a good start but then you would want to go beyond that and uh, and create a um, all these different organs are, are gonna work together for the for the well of the of the farm itself sure. Uh, that takes in consideration as well uh, different different uh, farming practices like uh, uh, teas, the, 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 the spray, the, what we call the the, the BD500, which is uh, the cow element of it. Um, all these parts are uh, more esoteric. Those uh, you may you may believe it or not. It doesn't. For me, it doesn't make any difference. It's a, the, the the results are it, it works, mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that uh, working in Tahiti, 
where we didn't have any uh, season, mm -hmm. no season, uh, no tide per se, uh, always always high, well, all, I mean, standard temperatures all, all, all year long. Um, the only uh, difference in uh, in the growing of, of the plants was the uh, the moon, pretty mm -hmm. much. So when I realized that, uh, I thought that the plant had so much, uh, it was so sensitive to these elements that we don't realize here because we, are, we have a lot of different parameters that are taking, uh, taking in consideration. But, but the cycle of the moon, the, the uh, influence of the, of the universe, of the stars on these plants, there is no better place than that it to really realize how much, how much it is. You know, when, when you take all of these um, uh, disturbance that we can have, like in, in our environment here, I mean, you see the, the universe has a huge influence. That's pretty much the only influence on the plants. Hmm. So now back in this context text here, I think it's, it's really interesting to take this into, into consideration and, and to use it as, as a tool. So uh, biodynamy is also about a calendar that uh, will uh, will do all these different practices or, or activities like pruning or harvesting or uh, hedging or leafing at the specific time during the year um, that that or diff during the month that would uh, correlate with some positions of the stars or or, or the moon or mm. anything that would have. Um, so then there is the, uh, the cow that, that's taken into consideration as well. That's, uh, that's another part that you may understand or, or not. But uh, the fact that we're using this uh, cow manure uh, in a way that it will enhance probably uh, the microorganism in the soil, it kind of makes sense. Uh, even if it's not, you know, we're spraying it as a homeopathic uh, quantity it's still uh, it's still quite interesting to to uh, think about mm -hmm. um, kind of an element of like mysticism almost to your biodynamic like almost kind of a holistic it, approach it, it is it is but uh, at the same time like I'm growing I'm growing grapes uh, with Northwest Fund Company I'm growing almost 600 acres of grapes that uh, for parties um, a small amount is uh, conventional, uh, and then a larger amount is uh, organic, mm -hmm. and another amount is is biodynamically farmed. Um, and I, I really, I really like working with the three of them. Like I'm moving more and more towards the organic and mm -hmm. and uh, even biodynamic. I'm not doing more biodynamic because it's a question also of uh, resources. Like we need, you know, more people. Uh, we need more time, more equipment to prepare the teas, etc. So I'm doing one step at a time. So slowly but steadily, um, I'm moving towards more and more organic or biodynamic farming. Uh, in 2012, no, 2010, uh, I was farming different vineyards in the valley. Uh, some were biodynamically farmed, some were conventional. Uh, we had a pretty high pressure of uh, mildew and this, this, during this particular year. Um, my biodynamically farmed vineyard um, were performing better than the conventional uh, spray. That, and it was quite interesting to, to re realize and say that, um, that it works. I mean, how? I'm not sure exactly, <laughs> but I, I really love embracing that. Another, another uh, reason why I, I, chose, I chose this particular farming uh, practices is also because it's not that difficult to put, put in place. Uh, we in Oregon are so lucky uh, to have so few uh, disease to fight. I mean, you know, uh, fungi, fun, you know, fungus or um, specifically, specifically uh, fungus. Um, in Europe, it's quite, it's a bit more challenging um, to be to be biodynamic. Uh, here, it's I would say I don't see why people are there. Is not more people that are organically farming because it's it's easy. 
And what about like a wine, your winemaking philosophy? And I'm also curious sort of how you developed that over the years. Uh, <clears throat> My grandfather used to say, uh, let the wine do its thing. Let's, let's let it go through all this uh, natural process so it, it will uh, it, it will give its best and just because also we have these different different soil types uh, here you have the different AVAs uh, the less intervention on the wine the, the, the more chances you have to to let the fruit express what's what the soil is about so for me that was the, that's the first part of my philosophy is uh, low intervention that doesn't mean I have to just let go and, and not, not, uh, not keep an eye on it. That's the second part. My grandfather was saying, like, always keep an eye on it and always make sure it goes in the right direction. <laughs> um, but beside that, yeah, it's a minimal intervention. That's what we, we, that's what we put on our label just because it's, um, you know, yeah, that's uh, the idea is to let the, let the wine talk about about where it, where the grapes were were grown. Um, but yeah, but, but it's a it's a constant um, surveillance of, uh, of of it. So a regular tasting, um, keeping the keeping the barrels, uh, keep, yeah, giving them the the best the best elements they have to get to get the best wine. So great barrels. Good temperature, good humidity. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a controlled. So do what you want, but in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. uh, making sure the barrels are topped all the time, really well. Adjust the sulfur. I'm not a non-sulfur uh, um, uh, winemaker. I'm, I, I know for me it's important to to keep the bacteria at a low level. Um, and and sulfur is a, is a natural element, so I don't see why I. I I shouldn't use it and um, stay away from it. Um, it's even produced by um, yeast themselves when they when they make uh, turn sugar into alcohol. They they produce their own um, their own sulfites. Um, so keeping yeah keeping the really really you know uh, controlled mm -hmm. environment and they go through uh, a steady path and give their best. So I'm curious, you may, you may have a better perspective about this than just about anyone we've ever interviewed. Um, tell me a little bit about the, different, the similarities and differences between making wine in Burgundy and making wine in the Willamette Valley. Um, making wine is very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I mean, there is no, there is no secret on, on winemaking. Uh, all the techniques are known by everybody. So if you if you want to take one path, you can. Uh, it's not that difficult. Uh, so people are sharing the same experience, pretty much. Uh, it's all about it's all about um, growing season. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about um, the fruit, the, the the soil, the difference in in the terroir. I would say, right. Um, we have a big, um, uh, the, the, the main difference between Oregon and, and Burgundy would be um, the acidity mm -hmm. um, and the ripeness. Uh, in Burgundy, um, we had a great acidity, great concentration. Uh, we're missing some um, ripeness. Not ripeness, but um, heat units um, to give some, some, some full characteristic of, of the wine. So we have all the, so in, in, a, in a perfect years, vintages where they have, uh, they, they achieve full ripeness, uh, they also keep a great acidity, so that makes the wines really, really well. And they're using, uh, in the other years, they're using chaptalization to add a bit of sugar to, to balance the ripeness. Uh, in Oregon, that's the opposite. So we have full ripeness uh, easily. Uh, we, 
we lack some acidity or we lack concentration in it's not necessarily acidity per se but it's a it's a complexity in the acidity that will um, not uh, could be balanced by a, uh, an earlier peak so then you cannot you, you cannot really achieve both except on the cooler years um, it's it's a tricky it's all a question of you know decision of when to pick mm -hmm. uh, in both both places it's uh, it's about when do you pick and in France obviously the government has more influence over what you grow and how mm -hmm. you grow it than here what is the how has that been for you kind of adjusting to kind of making all of your own decisions <clears throat> well that's uh, that's something I really embraced uh, quickly here <laughs> like doing whatever you want pretty much that's uh, that's really pretty amazing I, I didn't know that existed <laughs> That's a, that's a freedom, that's the freedom of, of America, right? Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, like we're seeing more and more people, I mean, we, we, like we, we put in some, some um, boundaries ourselves here in Oregon, yeah. all the community of, of growers and winemakers decided that uh, we want to be the best pro producers. So for that, we, we need to give ourselves some uh, some restrictions on what we can do. Um, what I'm seeing today is like we're going to go to towards more and more restrictions that we're going to put ourselves on. Mm -hmm. So somebody coming from another state cannot or even local event let's say okay I'm, I'm going to do whatever as long as there is it says we have a valley on the label we can do whatever we want. I think it's very risky for the entire community. So that's why we, we're trying to now to redefine um, how we want to make wine in, in, in the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. And being probably a bit more restrictive uh, because that's unfortunately that has to be if we want to keep on, on the quality level that, uh, that we've been making and we want to keep uh, and that's the reason why they put it that much uh, regulation in France. Maybe you are a bit too far at some point, but originally the idea was that, was to really make sure like we're not doing the crazy things and not, um, not uh, tarnishing the, uh, the image of the entire production. Sure. And now it's being done by the wine community itself as right. opposed to like legislation right. coming down. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. What do you see... Uh, say in the next five or ten years in terms of restrictive restrictive rules coming um, right now we're talking about uh, redefining uh, the quantity of Pinot that is in the bowl when we say Pinot Noir um, we want to be uh, the first uh, in the world that would say Pinot Noir, it's equals hundred percent Pinot Noir mm -hmm. in the bottle, which is not not true anywhere else. I mean, uh, even Burgundy, it's not it's not hundred percent. Uh, so we want to be the only one doing that. Mm -hmm. So give the true uh, the true uh, definition of, of what what's on the label. Another one is uh, is Willamette Valley as well. We want to protect as mm -hmm. much as possible. So. As I said, like somebody cannot really uh, do whatever they want to with, with the Willamette Valley, which is uh, now becoming like a, like a, um, a synonym of, of quality. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Domaine Divio a little bit. You're, you're still pretty new here. Uh, what do you see in the future here? What's, co what's coming down the pike for your, your place here? Well, I'm going one step at a time, so I'm going to start uh, produce. I started producing my first wine from the uh, domain, from the estate, in 2017. So it's um, it's really good. So we will, um, I'm in the process of blending right now and and trying to uh, to select the best the best barrels for for the estate. Uh, so next step will be to define which blocks are performing better or um, are most suited for, for here um, and then continuing working with the different AVAs so I can, I can really 
play with that myself, mm -hmm. which I, I love, but also uh, giving my clients uh, like uh, a portfolio of diff different wines we can we can make and mm -hmm. different flavors we can achieve in, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, the future, um, so far, I, I don't see further than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, trying to trying to give the best of what we have here. You mentioned earlier that you're fourth generation in this business. Uh, do you have plans to make it a fifth generation business? Do you have hopes that that will happen? Yes, my son, uh, my oldest son. Uh, is starting to go to OSU uh, in September to do the viticulture program. So if it works well, he will follow that with um, the Dijon University mm -hmm. and get a degree in winemaking also over there. That's uh, the idea. <laughs> um, that would be yeah, fifth generation. Um, and myself, I mean, I I'd probably if, if everything goes well and we want to develop a little bit more, uh, there are two paths we want to do. I want to maybe see if we can uh, acquire another uh, property um, in the valley where it could be, uh, could be interesting to grow grapes as well. Uh, and uh, my partner uh, got um, also a piece of land in, in Chablis that we may want to uh, to vinify ourselves and uh, and to bring over here as a uh, Domaine Divio Chablis. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, with the with the generations of winemaking if that has if you have if felt that's added any pressure to your job or felt if it's added any pride is there is there a difference coming from a lineage of winemakers or is it just kind of what you do? Uh, <clears throat> pride here, yes, definitely. Um, I really, I really love the the path uh, of my family and really embrace it, and and I'm happy to be part of this uh, uh, heritage. We within this heritage. Um, then uh, it's yeah, it, it might be challenging sometimes to not challenging, but. I would say sometimes I may have the sentiment, the, the, the feeling that uh, when I'm, I'm in the U.S., I'm, uh, I'm a little bit Burgundian, uh, and when I'm when I'm when I'm in Burgundy, I'm a little bit Burgundian, but I'm uh, I'm also I'm, home is here, <laughs> so I'm I'm a little bit in between. So sometimes it's not really easy to define exactly, but I'm. Instead of uh, being confused, I'm trying to em um, embrace both and, and having, making sure like I'm having both in my, in my um, philosophy, in my, um, my understanding on uh, growing grapes and making wine. Um, I think to, to really enjoy it, you have to be successful. So if you, if you, don't, you, know, if you don't succeed and, um, and to, to, to be successful, you have to have the right team, as I said, to, to take the good decisions, um, which sometimes is challenging, but it could, um, um, could be difficult. But then uh, so far, I think we've been uh, achieving what we are our goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and an American, I am an American citizen, but I'm also uh, a true Burgundian, so I'm embracing both, definitely. Sure. What are the biggest changes you've seen uh, in the Oregon industry since you've become a part of it? <clears throat> well, as everybody else, I think it's the, uh, the incoming of, uh, of big companies, uh, purchasing land and developing larger vineyards. Mm -hmm. um, we're still not sure where it's going to go. Um, so far, they've been showing some interest in really uh, producing the best possible Pinot and, and, and making sure like uh, uh, the quality is always the highest. Um, that's I hope it's going to stay like that. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing we can do against like uh, this. I mean, the more successful you are, the more interesting you are for uh, outsiders, mm -hmm. of course. So, and it's the other way. 
so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that it's true. Um, then um, then yeah it's it's I mean but there is so much potential here there is so much land available um, I mean it's gonna take time until like we we come to a like a saturation mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something of that kind so I'm, I'm pretty uh, optimistic in the future so speaking of that, what do you what do you see happening in the future, and what do you kind of hope happens in the future here? Well, uh, I hope we're going to be recognized as uh, as a, one in out of the three best producers of Pinot in the world. But keep keep this level. That's what I'm hoping for the future. Uh, I also hope that. Um, as I'm trying to push also my, my production into uh, being more and more towards very high-end Chardonnay producer. So uh, that's something I think it's growing now and, and we, we really embrace and, and I think there is no reason why we, we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and just, yeah, I'm just hoping for more uh, recognition of uh, on the entire Willamette Valley mm -hmm. as the producer. Yeah. Do you see the growth we're in the midst of right now continuing for the future? Do you see yeah. consolidation? You do see growth happening? Yeah, yeah. we're coming to a point where um, uh, some of the first generation of growers like they, they're coming to uh, retirement or they're coming to a point there they don't have any Hairs to take over, uh, no follow, -up, no follow up there. So they they're selling. To, they're selling to people that are uh, really interested in coming over, but they're newcomers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're seeing more and more of that. So small production, and then you know consolidation has probably makes some sense at some point for for some uh, developers, uh, some investors. Uh, so I yeah you know, I'm, I'm seeing that you know there are several wineries and that I know that um, are probably going to be uh, on the market or if not already on the market um, because they have, they, have, they have nobody in the family mm -hmm. taking over or um, um, that's something we could do as well like if we had uh, the opportunity maybe uh, I don't know. <laughs> What advice would you have for someone who wanted to start in the Oregon wine industry today? Like an investor that wants to develop a anybody, any any role, any level of the industry that we you would have advice for. Uh, if it's uh, if it's about growing grapes, I would say, don't start planting grapes and, uh, unless you know where your grapes gonna go. Having a market for it, not just growing grapes and, and and just hoping somebody's gonna buy it. That's the first advice, and I we see that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, making wine is actually easy. Once, as I said, like there's no secret. Like every, you, know, you can you can type online, you can find a, a recipe, pretty much. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I mean, it's, uh, um, you can learn easily how to make wine and, uh, and, and with the technology that you have nowadays, uh, uh, the equipment, all the, uh, all the elements that, that, that helps, uh, advices and such, uh, a lot of people, I mean, everybody can make good wine. Mm -hmm. Uh, selling it is another point like you have to you have to have something special in your wine you have to to have a, a real strong team that that helps you um, put it outside make make i mean it's it's really nice to make a great wine if nobody knows you are out there i mean <laughs> nobody's gonna buy it what's the point right if you if you want to drink your uh, your two pallets of wine yourself uh, during the year, that's that's okay. That's uh, if you have a big enough family that can really absorb this production, <laughs> that's great. But I mean, you you know, that's something to think about. Um, and even though 
you, 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 you already have a plan. It's most of the time it's more complicated than you think. And, and you have to understand your budget also really well. So it's not only growing grapes, it's not only making wine, it's, it's also uh, embracing. And I, it's really interesting that to see that Linfi College is, 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 uh, is working through all different uh, 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 facets of the, of the wine industry because it's not only one dimension, it's, it goes from it goes all directions. So uh, make sure you understand that before before starting your your business. Um, there is a lot of people in the market nowadays, and they're going to be more and more. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to understand why you're making it. You have to be passionate. That would be the yeah. You know, that would be number one. <laughs> passion, passion. Sure, sure. Making. Uh, Investment, it's, uh, it's interesting, it could work, just, just using it, you know, uh, doing, doing this for just for an investment. Uh, I don't think it will work really well unless you're passionate, that means you're really yourself involved into the entire process. Yeah. You mentioned uh, wine sales there momentarily. I'm curious. You started a brand, uh, right? As a lot of other brands were being were started. So you're talking about the, the how crowded the market is. Mm -hmm. What have you found in terms of sort of strategies and challenges for selling a new a newish wine brand today? Uh, for me, I mean, I didn't I didn't um, ask myself uh, what how I would, I would put that together. For me, it was uh, making sense, like was, that was my heritage, my story, um, and that's what people wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was, uh, it was pretty simple, I, mean, I would say, if, if so. But, um, so that, you, well, first of all, you have to have the, 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 per, the, the best wine possible. That's, that's a minimum, right? Uh, then you have to have the, the right environment. That's, uh, that's the second thing. And third, you have to uh, have a good team in place. Mm. Uh, and fourth, uh, your, your wine has to reflect your philosophy, your story, your personality. Um, if you want to uh, create, create some um, what do you want to create with your customers, or you want to create some? Uh, uh, you want to create a relationship right, through your product. So all of these helps the relationship. Uh, you want to, people to say, "Oh yeah, I know." Not just, "Oh, I want just another wine to put on the table." It's, you you want you want this relationship. Oh, know this guy, or uh, I. Uh, I mean, I, I love this wine. I. I've, there's some, some, something, it reminds me of something. It's, it always needs to tell a, a, a it's a piece of art, like a, like a painting, like mm -hmm. it has to tell you something. Mm -hmm. it's, not, um, it's not for your thirst, it just, <laughs> it's for the, the entire culture of, uh, of, the, of the product. Uh, it's not a product, it's a, it's a journey. It's, mm -hmm. It goes to another dimension because it takes so much of all different, uh, different elements of uh, nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is quite interesting. The, the, the climate, the, um, the geology, uh, the plant itself, um, the, uh, the thousands of years of uh, history, uh, the religious part of it, um, and uh, and, and the uh, and the human element, which is the community, and it always brings people together, mm -hmm. which is uh, one of the most exciting thing of, about creating wine. Is like it's not just for your thirst. It's uh, it's so much. There's so many dimensions. It's hmm. pretty. It's pretty great description. I like that. <laughs> um, that's all the questions that I have for okay. you. Is there anything else I should have asked you? Anything else you'd like to mention here at the end? Well, um, if uh, if you, I know how often you're gonna do this archive? Maybe 20 years from now, 
I hope I'm still going to be here to answer the question and see uh, how far I was from the from the tree, like uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, my predictions for the future or uh, how I see, I embrace the, the philosophy of winemaking here. Uh, maybe in the future we'll have um, we'll have a global warming that really is going to affect the vines, and then we're probably going to have to uh, to grow uh, coconut trees here or. Uh, mm -hmm. Or move to Alaska to, <laughs> to, to grow Pinot Noir. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you that in 20 years when you're going to come back to interview me again. Deal. It's a deal. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and all your answers and thoughts. You're and welcome. We'll go ahead. And